Hello there, welcome international movie fans. Today we got a very special international movie fans broadcast because you can see it here uh, to my uh, right. Uh, this is someone you don't see often on our channel because this is Hisko Hulsing and Hisko Hulsing is the director of the series. Yes, applause for uh, He is the director of the series Undone, animated series Undone on uh, Amazon Prime hit series. Very well uh, received by, by critics, 98% on Rotten Tomatoes, loved by audiences. So we are very honored uh, to have you here, uh, Isco. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. Yes, yes, we can see you in your studio, or what do we see at the background? Well, this is my own uh, studio where I used to make my uh, paintings and my, my short films. Um, for season one of Undone, I worked at Submarine, which is a, a production company of animation films and documentary films in Amsterdam. But because of Corona, I still have an office there, but most people who are working on uh, season two are working from their homes. So I don't see a lot of reasons to go there apart from uh, briefing the, the painters who come there with their pa real oil paintings for Undone. Mm -hmm. And I have to see them um, in real to be able to judge them. So uh, I just came back from going there on bike and, and coming back. But this is where I, uh, right now, I, I'm not allowed to talk about season two. So okay, we, uh, nothing, nothing we can get from you there? No, no, uh, the only thing I can say that I, I do a lot of work from here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's just, exactly. It's just, yeah, yeah, because because for the people uh, uh, watching Undone, the first season premiered uh, towards the end of 2019. Uh, animated series uh, episodes of 20 minutes uh, about well schizophrenia as a theme, but it's also the the well the the, the blurred lines between reality. Uh, I, I think you can describe it as. Um, yeah. It was a success, and now you're working on this on this second season. But because of COVID, it, there's some challenges there. Yeah, well, we weren't even sure if we could uh, pull it off because uh, how can you get actors on the set? Uh, you know, it was strictly forbidden in the beginning. And I cannot I cannot fly because on season one, I flew back and forth to LA seven times to direct the actors on set because to explain it to the viewers, we use a process called rotoscoping where we uh, film everything with actors, then edit it. We filmed the actors in, in a green screen studio, so there's no real set. There's just uh, marks and, and tape and things like that. And then we trace that live action footage uh, that's been done in Texas at Minnow Mountain, uh, so okay. and stylize it so that's all drawn. And then all the, the the whole creation of that world is done here in Amsterdam with 3D, but mostly with oil paintings, real oil paintings that we photograph. And then we color and shade all the animation, do all the 2D effects and 3D effects here. So in order to direct the live action, I had to go to yeah, Hollywood actually uh, for season one, seven times in one and a half year. And now that's uh, completely impossible. So we had to find other ways to do it. And, uh, yeah. and now we found a way and it's actually working very well. And, yeah. and how, how do you do it now? I'm not allowed to talk about it, but okay. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> so, uh, no, really, I, I can talk about it. It's just I can just say that the thing about Corona is that it's uh, the world became a bit colder. I think it's you know it's less gezellig, cozy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, and and but um, it, it, I think in our production we had to find ways to be more efficient. There's no okay. other way you can do it. So it's, it's sort of working very well. And also because uh, most people who worked on season one had one and a half year to, to get to a certain level. And now mm -hmm. they started on that level. Yeah, so we're yeah. starting with like a very well educated and uh, skilled team. So it's in a way it, it, it goes so good right now. And I think it will yeah. be better than season one even. Yeah. Okay. It, even with being yeah. being on a on a on a distance, because I, I I assume that you direct now through video conference, video call, so to say. Yeah. Uh, I I can imagine that you lack that that personal connection, what you which you you haven't said. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> now we're getting into the spoilers territory again. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But maybe you can give us one anecdote, the one the one you gave me when we we bumped each other in Amsterdam in the. We in didn't the bump each other. <laughs> we we bumped each other. Into each other. Okay. Uh, 
excuse me for the wrong uh, yeah. pick of words. Uh, we bumped <laughs> into each other at the Lab 111 uh, Cinema <laughs> Office building. Yeah. And, you had, and you had a lovely anecdote about uh, uh, directing with actors, uh, especially Bob Odenkirk, who is like a, a famous name from the for the big audience, I think. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you can uh, share I, I don't that. remember the anecdotes. What, what ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I mean, what but did I say? I, yeah. Uh, I asked you uh, how it is now to 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 be a director and to to actually be more busy with uh, actors and their uh, well. well I don't, their, I don't, maybe uh, the anecdote was that I don't know if this was the anecdote because there's a lot of anecdotes. But yeah. one of them was that that uh, during the first episode of season one, he called me kiddo, which was not very pleasant. And was this one or not? Yes, is this, this the one. one? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, then he found out that I was actually uh, that I actually knew what I was doing. So the second uh, episode, he called me Hisco, which is my name. And after that, so episode three, three till eight, he called me Sir. So it's okay, so you very, rose quite uh, a lot of respect. Yeah, rose very, very uh, <laughs> fast. Yeah, and it's weird because that's the thing with uh, I don't know if it's typically Hollywood or or American, but it's this film world world is very hier hierarchical. And okay. uh, that's the only way to make this machine working. Like, uh, you know, to, if I give a note to the DOP, to the camera, uh, head of the cameras, then that, you know, trickles down to the other yeah. department. So that's a very fast way to communicate because it's very clear who is the, the who is hiring the pyramid. And I'm not the highest in the pyramid uh, because there's still the writers who are, the showrunner in, yeah. show in a series, yeah. the, those are the showrunners, and the, 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 they are being called creators in sort of a godlike you know, <laughs> words. I don't know, it's a bit too much. Uh, but you're directly the, under them. Um, yeah, but officially I'm directly under them. So that's in the whole system. I have to uh, deal with their notes also. In reality, we, uh, especially me and Kate, Kate Purdy, who is uh, one of the two showrunners, and she's, I would say, the story originates for a large part from her and, and from Raphael Bob Boxberg, but she's yeah. most involved. And we are friends, I would say, and we are communicating more on the same level. So we, when we're directing, we're always uh, discussing everything. And it's not, it doesn't feel hierarchical at all. She's also on, on set always. Yeah, always. Yeah. And, and yeah. we just, and she can be, uh, you know, we can ask each other questions. It doesn't feel like she's telling me what to do or anything. Right. Not at all. That's all we do two different things. So it's, uh, but yeah, that's how it works. Okay. So, yeah. So we're now quite far in the we we in the process. But what I'm curious is about is like, of course, we've been digging in a bit to your to your resume, and also I've watched uh, a movie like uh, Junkyard. Uh, and if you look at the end credits of Junkyard, I see Hisko Hilsen uh, directed, Hisko Hilsen produced, Hisko Hilsen <laughs> written, and even Hisko Hilsen composing the music. And then yeah. you now come at this machine of 120 uh, uh, people. Uh, how how is that 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 difference? Well, the difference is that um, I used to think that, first of all, there was only money with those short films. You know, you get money from the film fund and maybe from a fund in Belgium. Uh, and there's always too little money. So um, it took me six years to make an 18-minute 18 18 film, uh, Junkyard. Yeah. And because there's not enough money and I had to do commercial work all the time to make sure that I could do it. So okay. uh, that means that that was one of the reasons that we couldn't hire a lot of assistants. But I also thought that I was, it was not really arrogance, but I'm also sort of a control freak that I wanted to make sure that everything was exactly like I wanted. So yeah, you're that's why, that. yeah, so that's why I can still watch Junkyard without, and I, I still love it. You know, I don't mean this in an arrogant way, but yeah, I love Undone too, and it has a much bigger audience, etc. But I see way more mistakes that were due to to extreme time pressure, so we yeah, had to move yeah. on. But um, so when I started doing uh, Undone, we get a team around uh, for the production, and in the beginning, I was still trying to do everything myself. So I, I would edit the storyboard because I thought, ah, oh, that's easy. I just do it, you know, and I've done it so many times. So I would yeah. storyboard. And, but I, 
slowly, too slowly. <laughs> I found out it's absolutely impossible. <laughs> if yeah, you yeah. have to do three hours of animation in one and a half year, <laughs> and, and, and 200 people you have to direct, you cannot be uh, like a workhorse. You have to be uh, smart with your time. So you have to delegate almost everything. Yeah. So I'm not painting anymore. I'm not drawing anymore. I'm not making music anymore. I don't do anything I like anymore. No, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the, the, I think that's a big question. Do you exactly. like it? Your New York challenge as a director, do you like it? Yeah, what I, what I liked, especially, yeah, what I liked in season one. So that's the thing. Um, I have to delegate stuff to others. And sometimes it turns out, first of all, that I do it better than I could ever do it. And second of all, People, what, what was new to me is that I always thought that in huge production in Hollywood where too many people uh, interfere with the ideas, mm. that everything would be weakened down. That was mm. my, my vision. And that's what you too see. Too many sometimes. compromises or... Too many compromises. Yeah. And, and that's, well, there are always compromises. But now I saw the other side of the story. That is that what happens is there's a lot of very good brains, brain power. Mm -hmm. So you can make develop stuff much and much faster than when you're alone. I mean, if I would come to a few, uh, special effects meeting, I would spend an hour, mostly just an hour, going through an episode before we made it, you know, to see where the special effects were and how all the transitions would be. Then we had this meeting and I would so come up with ideas or, or, you know, and then allow other people to not come up with their ideas. So what you get, and it's also on the set, like you have some, uh, you know, preconceptions or some ideas about how to do it. And then somebody comes up with another idea and uh, with solutions. So it goes so much faster. So yeah. working, working with a team, I mean, this almost sounds like, like an open door. I don't know if you can say that in, in, yeah. Yeah. in English. I have no idea. Uh, no, it's, 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 kicking it's, in an open door, yeah. kicking yeah, in yeah, an open yeah. door. Like, yeah, right, of course, yeah. yeah, it's like, it's in all, that's how, how, people are able to do great things because we can yeah. work in large groups. But for me as an artist, yeah. you, you're used to work in a solitary way where you can yeah. really yeah. meditate on every decision or just follow your instincts. And you cannot direct a, direct a huge production like this by right. just following your instincts. It's not possible. So yeah, that no. was um, a, a, a great uh, discovery. And the other thing that I liked, especially dur during season one was that it felt like a, a big family almost because we were mm. all uh, together and and it feels like a, a so the social aspect was something i really enjoyed and that's yeah. gone and that's gone now so that's a pity yeah. then, how did you start realize that you're good in this work well <laughs> i don't know if i'm good at this work i mean well probably. you might you might assume by now a bit like the yeah. the, the facts speak for itself you i think it off, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I don't consider myself to be a really good director. I mean, I, I'm i still learning. That sounds a bit too modest. I mean, I know what I'm doing mm -hmm. and I'm limited by uh, what I'm doing by, because of money and budgets and everything. And uh, I do, I def, you know, I, I, I'm doing this for 25 years already. So I'm, when I'm, I'm, not only I made short films and did animation for Montage of Hack, but I also made probably about 200 storyboards for commercials and okay. other stuff. Yeah. So at some point, there's many things that you don't have to think about anymore because you did them so many times. Yeah. It's just, it's just- It I've, becomes I've, a routine. It, well, it becomes, routine is, yeah, routine is, uh, but the routine sounds a bit boring or it's, it sounds a bit, uh, you know what I'm saying? Routine yeah, sounds yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. not again. Well, this oh, actually sounds thing, like- yeah. It's just like, like It is like that. Yeah, yeah, it is like, like the, Alma. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, but it is it, sometimes actually it is getting a bit boring because, you know, a lot of cover is what you in, in, in live action, a lot of what you do in dialogues is called coverage, where you just switch between, you know, uh, wide shots, medium shots, you know, over the shoulders and, um, and singles and two shots. And there's a couple of variations, and, and mm -hmm. mostly you shoot, uh, shoot. Uh, all the angles, and then you decide in editing which ones you use based on the storyboards that we already made. So that's the boring part in a way. I mean, it's not boring because it's great that the acting is so fantastic that you can enjoy the acting while they're doing it. And uh, th that's another thing I found out, how fantastic actors are. 
I yeah. never, I mean, I've, I've uh, educated myself in becoming a director. Uh, I didn't do film academy or anything. I went to the art academy, but I had to, uh, my first film was so clueless. I mean, it was, it looked great, but I had no idea about filmmaking. So I had to educate myself and I did it. I remember I was a fan of um, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson, you know, from Boogie Nights and Magnolia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know those, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and and he did a film course uh, for only two weeks or something, and he thought it was such a bullshit what I told him there, uh, because he 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 had to do some assignment and he just <laughs> used some script of one of his favorite movies and acted as if he wrote it and he got a D minus or something, and he thought okay they don't know yeah. what they're talking about, <laughs> so so he he recommended to just watch as many films as possible, listen to yeah. the audio commentary. Uh, read interviews and that's how I did it so I watched yeah. that was the film. what I did when I was in my 20s was I would watch a film in the morning for instance and then at night at, in the evening I would watch it again and then I would sort of try to analyze it so mm -hmm. like how how long does is this shot and what is it yeah. and then I would see new things and then I that's really how I learned it and by doing it and and now so my I think the hardest part in Undone but also my most important part I would say is briefing the storyboarders. And I don't have mm. time to storyboard myself. So what I do, I take a whole episode and I make in five days or something, I make about three or 400 thumbnails, which are very small, mm. very rough sketches okay. because I have to visualize when I read the script and it says the room folds into itself. What does that mean? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, yeah. it's a visual yeah. clue, but it doesn't give any details. So then yeah. I have to think about, geez, uh, how am I going to do that? And that takes a lot of brain power. And, and then the visual storytelling is also very much about exactly where you put the camera, what angles yeah. are super important because you want to emphasize certain things, you know? So, if, yeah. so in that way, I think I'm a good director is that I, well, not a good director. I think I'm, no, I just I just realized lately that, that I became a bit too uh, blasé or arrogant. So I want to be I want to be the old Hisco again, who is more modest because more modest. You were <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> yeah, you were so capable of it. What? Sorry? Let's say capable then a capable director. I, I'm not ca very capable. <laughs> well, that sounds so mediocre. So I, I say that. yeah, yeah, it's one thing or another. Yeah, it's one thing or the other. That's true. Well, I'm ambitious. Let's say ambitious. Ambitious. ambitious okay. 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 Let's put it yeah. And, and I think. And, yeah. and I think that uh, <clears throat> let's say the, um, it's not only just the technique of visual storytelling, like where do you put emphasis, you know, which is a very important thing. But for me, a super important thing is uh, emotion. Yeah. So, uh, the, of course, the most of the emotion comes from the actors and from the dialogues and from the script. Mm -hmm. But it's also in visual storytelling. So it's very important to to uh, tell it in a way that certain things hit you, you know, yeah. visually too. So I think that's one of the most important yeah. things. And, and, how, and, and how do you do that? And when you look at a series like Undone, like you said, the actor, actors, it's quite well, easy. You have to be a good actor to convey the emotion, but how do you do it visually? It, there's so many different uh, ways to do it. You know, it's a, there's a big difference between if, if uh, for instance, um, Elma is laying in a, in a hospital bed and then suddenly Jacob sitting next to her, yeah. uh, her father who has been dead for 20 years. Yeah. I mean, there's many ways you can do that, but if you use a very slow fade in, yeah. it's, it's much more dreamlike and much yeah. more, much more uh, emotional because it's, it's sort of, um, <clears throat> it's so hard to explain because these things are really based on, watching films and knowing what works and, and also yeah. feeling it myself. Like exactly, if, yeah. if I don't feel it, pro probably other people won't feel it either. It won't, it won't work, no. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, if, well, I, if, well, I get, yeah. if I get, yeah. if I'm getting emotional about a scene, I, I know for sure that other people, some other people will get emotional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what was it in this uh, story, uh, Hisko? Uh, um, what, because when did you get contacted about Undone first, the first time, how did that go? Well, I did animation for a film about Kurt Cobain called Montage of Heck. I think that was around when Sven came over here to photography, uh, to uh, yes. make pictures here. Yeah, uh, where I, I, I was in your studio there. Yeah, yeah. Over I, here. Yeah, yeah, I recognize yeah. it, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, production also. 
Yeah, I, lo I loved that film and it was a very hard film to work on, but it got em uh, nominated for eight Emmys. It was not directed yeah. by me. I, I did the animation about, with my team. If, uh, it was about seven or eight minutes. Um, but that film um, uh, also was nominated for an Emmy Award, not eight, eight Emmys, but also Emmy, uh, which is the, the Animation Industry Award. Mm -hmm. And um, produced from Bojack Horseman were also there because they were also nominated. And they saw parts of Montage of Heck and Kate Purdy and Raphael Borgsberg already had written the first two episodes of Undone and they had pitched it to the producers. Yeah. And when they saw Montage of Heck, they thought, well, this could be the style for Undone. And oh, okay. they also saw Junkyard and they watched it together with Kate and Raphael. And they also saw the, that I had so, a certain kind of sensitivity and a certain kind of, um, I think that would fit the dreamlike atmosphere of Undone. And at the time I was in, um, in a jury in Berkeley, uh, in, the, in the neighborhood of San Francisco. And when I was in the airport, I kind of, an email like oh, we're producers for, for Michael Eisner because they're working for Michael Eisner who used to be head of Disney for 20 years and of Paramount. So that sounded very interesting already. Yeah. And, uh, like, <laughs> I'm ambitious, I told you. And uh, <laughs> do you ever come to uh, California? And I said, well, I'm actually going there now, but I don't have time to come to LA because I'm in a jury. So then they took an, uh, the two producers, Steve Cohen and, um, and Noel Bright, took a plane to spend the night in my hotel to have one breakfast with me, just oh, wow. to pitch pitch undone to me, and I was oh, just really? yeah, and I was just on the on the verge. Wow. Oh, sorry. I was just on the verge of quitting animation, sort of, because I it's a it's very hard work and it's almost impossible to make enough money. So I always have mm. to do shitty commercial jobs, and I was really <laughs> fed up with it. Yeah, yeah. So and then, um, but then they pitched it to me. And it sounded exactly like the thing I always dreamed of, like having, yeah, because yeah. when you make a film yourself, or when you write your own film, like Junkyard, I was insecure for six years about the story. You know, it's a, it's a very tough thing to have to work so hard and not to be sure if it's going to be yeah. any good. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then with Undone, when I read the script, I was already, uh, you know, crying a couple of times and laughing yeah. out loud in the airplane. And, and the thing was, it was, my always my dream that I could work with a script that was good that other people wrote and it also touched very much on everything I'm interested in like the the, the, the small the thin edge between reality, reality. And dreams and fantasy yeah. and about the inner world of people which is all my films about are about that the inner yeah. world. why are you, why are you so why are you so interested in in, in that uh, I, I don't know why. I just know that that already as a child, I was always dreaming a lot. So I tried to draw my dreams, you know, and, and I think when I um, was an adolescent, I smoked too much pot. That's how I got kicked out of school. And because of that, I was, I don't think I had a real psychosis in a way that somebody would have uh, diagnosed it as, as a psychosis, but it was true that I had, uh, I don't know the English word, uh, uh, yeah, delusions, delusions. I was delusional yeah. and, and that that's very scary. It's very scary. If you have the feeling that you cannot trust reality anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm done is exactly about that, you know, and, yeah. but it's also about the beauty of imagination. So yeah. it's about, she has this choice yeah. from, do you want the boring life? Do you want yeah. the paid by numbers yeah. reality timeline, or yeah. do you want to do something else? And that something else is like, it's like a, a promise, you know, like a, a very attractive uh, thing, but it's also scary. And yeah. uh, and especially and because in season one, it's am ambiguous. That's the whole yeah. pow power of the series, if she's delusional or schizophrenic or if she's really experiencing this. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, that was a very important thing for me as a director. I think if you ask me, do you think you're good as a director? Then I, I can't tell you if I'm good or not, but I know that I made a couple of good decisions. And one of them was to film it in such a way that we're always with Elma. So, which means that we're sort of on her journey. So yeah. to us, it's also really, sort of really happening, although you're all never sure about it. But she's yeah. also- yeah. And you're all, of course, always, uh, well, doubting 
what's real and what's not real, those fading lies between between reality. Well, you're not going to give uh, the answer to us, so I. Uh, well, the, the thing uh, is, we don't, I don't. No, no, it's not even that. It's, I don't. Okay. Even know, I don't even. Know you don't that. even know. Okay. No, but but oh, really? the, yeah, I don't know the answer, and and I'm pretty sure the the writers don't know the answer too. But that's nice. the whole. That's the whole power of the series. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was yeah, it also? So that, yeah. Was it also a personal journey for you in some way? This series. Um. Yeah, it's still going on. I mean, yeah. <laughs> now, what, what I'm saying, of course, it's a per personal journey, and and it, it is true that it's such a different thing from working in a solitary way. Or do we, in what way do you mean it? Sorry. Well, as as what you explained, like uh, what you uh, experienced when you were young. Uh, so maybe some autobiographical part, oh. although it's although it's not even written on your life. Uh, you got to see the script in the plane and you were crying and laughing so yeah, it did yeah, something yeah. did a lot of it caused a lot of emotions yeah so I, I think although it's not written on your life you can still um of course yeah. Ex yeah experience as, as, as a personal journey uh, absolutely yeah it was yeah. like and of course uh, there were many things in uh, especially in episode two that hit me because it's a whole hospital room scene, you know, and I, I remember spending months uh, in the hospital with my father who was dying 20 years ago. So, that, that, but that's just something that, that is, could be a common experience for a lot of people with mm. their parents who died. And there's nothing too personal about that. But at that moment, when I read it, it was, there were so many connections and, you yeah. uh, know, but if it's a personal journey in that, no, it's just, it's not like that. You know, the thing is, um, when you're working under so much time pressure with so many people, you have to make hundreds of decisions every day. So there's no way to get too deep into it. No, uh, no. Uh, it, it happened to me the first two episodes. And now with season two, I also have some deep relations with what's going on. But it's it's different from a film like 17 that you probably didn't see, but it's an yeah. old short film that I made. Okay. And I just saw it again. Uh, I put it on Facebook, actually, okay. and on YouTube, just a week ago, because I, because it was exactly seventy years ago that it premiered, and that's uh, and then I saw it again, and I was like, "That's really personal." When I made that film, that's so honest, and everything about it is it comes from from me. Okay. And, mm -hmm. and Don really comes from Kate Purdy and Raphael Boxberg mostly, and then their writer team, and then we share it with. 200 art, I don't know how many artists who all have their part in it. And I just try to make sure that it's all be communicated in a, in a meaningful way to the audience. Yeah. And, but so in that way, it's the personal jury journey is for me was on a different level. It was just like yeah. working with such a great team, good team and, um, and finding out that, that I can do things that I never did before. For instance, I remember the first, one of the first days in, on the set in LA, that I said to, I, you know, I, was, I wasn't scared or anything, but I, I did work with actors before with short films, but they were not, they were amateurs, most of them, yeah. you know? And now I was, I was on the set with a real crew, you know, with 25 people and actors like Bob Odenkirk and Rosa Salazar. And I said to Bob Waxberg, I said, uh, uh, paraphr you know Pippi Langhaus, Pippi Langstrumpf? Yeah, yeah yes. I, I, I live in Sweden, so yeah, I know. <laughs> of course you know. Yeah. So, 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 so I referred to her. I said, I've never done it be before, so I'm sure I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that sort of helped me. It sort of, I think I've always been like that, that I take huge risks because there's some, there's always some overlapping thing that I did, you know? Yeah. And actually I found out that this was easier than directing M more amateur, uh, like the kids that I directed for Junkyard, they were much harder to direct because they don't know, they don't have the skills to do it. Yeah, of course. No, and, no. And, 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 and the actors on the set, they understand the script. They know, understand it almost better than I do, you know? So yeah. they, you don't have to tell them a lot. They, they know what they're doing. And um, it is really, uh, they give you a present uh, with every take. It's like, I could never have imagined them to play it like this. I would, you know, sometimes you read a line and you think it's a very sad line. And then Rosa makes a joke out of it. And it, 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 it gets so much more subtext and so much more. It, it's already very layered, these, these scripts. You know, that's yeah, what I yeah. found out the first time when I read the, the first two episodes. I already felt like, because I, I read a lot of scripts in the past, and especially in the Netherlands, 
everything is so clear and so you know and in mm. this script every spelled out. Yeah. yeah spelled out and here in these scripts there was so much subtext and things in between mm -hmm. the lines that, that there's a world of underlying emotions and meanings yeah. and yeah. then so that's already in script and then the actors yeah. they do their take on it which is always unpredictable especially to be honest with not with all of them but especially rosa she can do scenes now in season two that i would imagine as being very serious and psychotic and everything but she she plays it as if it's a big adventure as if, yeah. she, as, <laughs> as if she's in a wizard of Oz or something and yeah. then suddenly it becomes a whole different thing and then we animate it and we do all the, the paintings and the, and the and animation and then it becomes another thing again and then the music is being added and so it's it's never you can never foresee what it's going to be exactly no. now no. But uh, I thought always that the director is really strict on um, guiding their uh, actors yeah, to telling them what kind of emotion they should sh put in the scene. But here I I, I hear <coughs> that you you leave it a lot, a lot open to their interpretation. Well, I think um, the way it works on the set is that I'm the, I'm officially the director. I direct the the, the crew and uh, mm -hmm. I I decide. What the camera angles are, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's all we all prepare it here in the now. So we we storyboard three thousand shots and we do all the, uh, the the designs. But on the set, I'm always with Kate, or in the beginning also with Kate and Raphael, and they as showrunners they would more interfere with the actors, like giving them okay. some okay. notes. Okay. And yeah. I did it as, as little as possible, and actually, right now uh, we don't give them a lot of notes at all. It's, it's just because they do it so well themselves and this right. is not this is not laziness it's just like they know their characters so well and and oh, also oh, in, in oh. season two even when i when i read the scripts when i read the scripts i already can hear rosa say Doing those lines it, it, or, or yeah. bob Odenkirk or angelica Cabral or constance marie because it's being written for them mm -hmm. so yeah. there's not sometimes i think oh this is a bit i just asked kate should should this be a little bit smaller? Is this isn't that too much, or is it too angry? More those kinds of like it's dialing a little bit, like tuning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah tuning I, that's that's also I learned from Paul Thomas Anderson. Why that's why I dare to do it because Paul Thomas and Paul Thomas Anderson said the same thing. Like I never give instructions. I just let them do it because yeah. they're intelligent. They're all all very good in their craft, and I just tell them a bit more, a bit less, and that's really it yeah, yeah. for yeah. me. And there's also other kind of directors who are very uh, like my favorite uh, director of all times is Roman Polanski, mm -hmm. and and he is an actor himself. Uh, in my, my favorite film of all times is The Tenant, The Locataire, and he plays the main character. So he would go do endless rehearsals with his actors, and then while yeah. he was already, you know, giving all kinds of uh, ways to act, he was at the same time he was sort of then deciding what camera would do mm. after that so that's a whole mm. different approach but there's different many approach, di yeah. many different approaches just with as with painting you know i paint in a very traditional way but uh there's as many techniques are there as there are painters and it's the same with writing i mean there are people who just get up and start writing at six and then go on till five and there are other people who need yeah you're like that okay <laughs> Bus, and bus, bus is one. <laughs> I, 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 write, okay. I write in the morning, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah but yeah, that's yeah. not not till five. I also got my uh, money projects, uh, like you talk talked yeah, about. Yeah, yeah that yeah. uh, has to be done. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh... yeah. It, differ, it differs per uh, person. Mm -hmm. A good example of that, as I think, is uh, uh, there's one interview between Stephen King and uh, George R. R. Martin, where George R. R. Martin asks Stephen King, like. How the hell do you write so much? Because you have so much yeah. books, and George R. R. Martin is known for being very uh, uh, well slow with his writing. Just uh, yeah. sometimes just re uh, writing two sentences on a day. Uh, yeah. So that's uh, <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so, so many people. But you talked about uh, actors. Um, Angelique Cabral, one of the st one of the actors in in Andan, she said that the technique that you implemented in the series will change television. Um, what what is it? <laughs> uh, that's that's what you call um, uh, promotion. Yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> Adverti advertising. Yeah. But but <coughs> I think for, for me at least this is something I haven't seen uh, before. That maybe says also something about me. But uh, what what is game changing about about this series? 
You already talked a bit about the techniques. No, what I think is, I mean, it's being compared a lot with uh, Richard Linklater's films, uh, uh, Scanner Darkly and Waking Life. Mm -hmm. uh, and to, to a point that I got annoyed because at some point there were more articles referring to Richard Linklater than the refer referring to me, you know. But uh, oh, yeah. yeah, that was sad. And, and we worked with some, uh, with the, the, the team in Texas who did the rotoscoping, they did work, some of them worked on. Um, on uh, both films, Scanner Dark and, and uh, that's why we uh, contacted them. Uh, but uh, so that's not a real game changer. I think the game change thing about Undone is that it's adult animation um, that's done in such a realistic way. So there's nothing being done in television like this. There has been done, there's where some films like this, but television with this kind of huge audience hasn't mm -hmm. really been done before. And it's also, uh, I think that's the main thing, actually. And then for me personally, but I mean, this is something that not a lot of people notice, but the mix of very traditional techniques, like the, the 17th century kind of painting, wh which adds a lot of you know, human touch to it, combined with super modern techniques yeah. and acting. And so all these ing ingredients is a unique thing, in my opinion. Yeah. Because I think the Rothschild films that have been made were not as... I mean, they were nice, but they were not as aesthetically well thought out. This is very something that has been developed to a level that is pretty high, I would say, from our, our whole team. You know, it's like yeah. mm -hmm. we didn't, we, we were really very concerned with quality and with the atmosphere and all those things. Yeah. And, the, and that's sort of, yeah, that's also a part of the emotion that you feel. Yeah. It's very, it's very realistic. I think that's what what you can see from the start, and at least when I saw it the first time, in the beginning, I think okay, I'm looking at to an animated series. But yeah. very quickly, while watching, you get the feeling like uh, you're in a just watching a live action uh, uh, movie mm -hmm. almost. Yeah. It's also uh, reality is fading away, so to say. So yeah. uh, well, very well done. Yeah, thank you. For me, it's uh, impossible to see it that way, of course, because I'm uh, we made it, but. That's what I hope that uh, what I see from user comments, for instance, and from critics, mm -hmm. is that at first they're they're not so sure about if they would like it, and then when they get into the story, they're completely sucked in. <laughs> I, I and, had and that, it, yeah, yeah. So oh. that's and that's for many reasons, but it's just you have to get used to that weird yeah. reality, and yeah. that's also the, the power yeah. of the series is that that yeah. weird reality. Yeah remains weird all the time because uh, I've said it many times before, but it's it's as weird if she's eating porridge as mm -hmm. when she's suddenly flying through the air. It's the same yeah, kind yeah. of weirdness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's also really the strength about this, uh, well, about animation and then this type of animation that you you can uh, in interpret the, the plot uh, as much yeah. as possible, mm -hmm. more than with, uh, real, with live action uh, reality uh, acting. Um, yeah, I think, well, you can use more your image, you can implement your imagination yeah. more. Yeah, I think. yeah, I think so too. Yeah, yeah, go more yeah, into the mind. Yeah, it's probably true. Now, well, well, I think it's true. What is true about it is that, um, like in live action, for instance, horror films, they they use suspense of disbelief, you know, suspension of disbelief. So, you uh, you just come to a point where you accept that it's reality. And then that's why horror can work because then something horrible happens and it feels like it's happening to you, you know? Yeah. And with animation, it's a bit different because it's artificial by default. So yeah. when you watch animation, you, you know that it's not real. Yeah. And that's why it's often associated with children's entertainment because children yeah. don't really are not that aware of those kind of distinctions and no. they're aware of it, but they don't care. Yeah. And, um, and I think that what we did is we used that uh, artificiality or superficiality uh, as a, a story element, like yeah. the fact that you are not, you know, it's yeah. not real, but still, it is real. Is very uh, weird, and, and that helps the story. For yeah. but it's, yeah. I wouldn't say it's completely premeditated. It just happened to work this way. Yeah. But I was interested uh, about uh, a lot. You have to create these two worlds, more or less, that that that, that she's she's in, and we are struggling with the fact what's real and what's not real. Um, 
how's it for you personally? Do you do you uh, are you open for the idea that there's that that a, her other world might be real, so to say, without giving answers to if it is, or that there is something in between? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, it, it is a very metaphysical question, I think. Mm. <laughs> uh, I think that, well, for me, it's like whatever worlds there are, they're all part of the universe. So there's no yeah. different worlds. There's, uh, anything that, that exists is part of reality. Yeah. Um, what I do believe is that actually uh, I was like 10 years ago, I was very uh, rational, very intellectual. I, was very, I wasn't very intellectual, but I'm, I was very interested in intellectual matters. And you know, so I would read philosophy and uh, like very rational and, and, uh, but, and very atheistic, anti-religious and everything. And, but I always had a very uh, strong sense for mysticism. It's not that I, that I feel something mystic happening i don't believe that it's actually mystic but it's just a part of my soul my brain mm -hmm. that reacts to things that are kind of dreamlike you know yeah. uh, so if i'm in a beautiful catholic church or like i was in a church in ukraine with the orthodox people and i, and I felt that you're being sucked into a dream so for me the um, i think that we make a, a big distinction between dreams and reality i don't think that the distinction is so big for instance, if you're in reality, so if you're awake, um, all kinds of electromagnetic pulses come from all sides into this mm -hmm. little hole here, your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They are being translated by your uh, uh, retina to your brain. Yeah. Your brain creates a world out of it. Yeah. yeah. The world that you see is actually created by your brain. It is based on what's really out there. But it's still created. This vision is created yeah. by the brain. And then when you when you dream, that your brain creates a world that doesn't have external uh, influences. So yeah. the difference is is it, there is a big difference, but it's arbitrary and not arbitrary. Right. It's it's a difference, but it's a difference that has to do with meaning, because in reality things have a meaning, and in dreams things, well, they are sort of chaotic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'm very aware of that, and I'm also aware that that uh, how even and my favorite uh, science fiction writer is Stanislav Lem. He wrote Solaris mm. that, that was okay. filmed by Tarkovsky. I don't know if you saw it. And he's, he was a super intelligent guy. And if you read his books, for instance, Solaris, okay. he always uh, fucks with the idea that you uh, think you understand something. Now you think you understand them and in the next page it's all completely different. Yeah. And it's just yeah. a way of him yeah. telling like, don't overestimate your yeah. original thoughts. The universe is way That's more strange. That's with, the with, movie with Clooney, no? Well, that's a remake, yeah. Oh, that's the remake. Remake, well, the remake by, by uh, what's his name? Uh, Sonnenberg. I don't like that director okay. at all. Okay. okay. And, uh, <laughs> but the first one was made, made by Tarkovsky. So but the idea that, that reality, uh, we have a certain uh, idea about it, and everybody has a different idea. Yeah. Uh, we have to just find a way through reality. But the universe, like for instance, if you start um, getting interested in quantum dyna dynamics, which of course the father of Elma in Undone, he's a, he's a modern yeah. uh, theoretist, theoretic uh, physicist. Mm -hmm. he, he has this theory that <laughs> because subatomic particles can have strange connections in time, which is true, and in space, that we as human beings can also have strange connections with time. So that's how yeah. his idea developed that you can travel in time or uh, different yeah. realities. So that's also a part of the series. And that's just something that that's probably, it's just a theory and a fantasy. It's in reality, it's different. But the thing is that the more we know about the universe, the stranger it gets. You know? That's the thing. But, but that's the interesting thing, of course, about the series. What is reality? And that's something we can ask ourselves about everything. So I was yeah. uh, curious how you were thinking about it, because I think if you make a series like this, you must also have some thoughts uh, about that. Yeah. I yeah. do. Yeah. And I, actually, it's funny because I... No, I should not say this. I put an, I put an <laughs> Easter egg. I put an Easter egg in season one that nobody... As far as I know, nobody, nobody wrote oh, about shit. it, found it out. And it's it has to do with modern physics. I mean, okay, 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 okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, we're going to do research yeah. about that yeah. in our exactly. uh, review. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, but I'm not going to uh, spoil it. Spoil it. I, I, I thought it would some uh, physicist nerds would, would, physics nerds would find it out, but I haven't seen anything on, uh, no. on the wow. internet. Yeah. Okay, so that's a tip. Yeah. But, but, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. 
Yeah, did you or your team or uh, the producers, did you guys do any uh, research into uh, the tribes that are mentioned constantly in the show? Yeah, also? the tribes. Yeah, yeah. the, 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 yeah, the, yeah, the, the shamans with their brains, with the, the bigger spots they have. Sorry, the what? Yeah. Uh, it was also with the sh like both uh, the father, Alma, and, 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 and Jacob's father, or mother. They all had the brain. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, with, well, that's uh, a real, yeah, the ventricles. Yeah, the large yeah, so That's a real thing, yeah. but also there were also research into the, like, if the shamans. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's totally Kate. Kate is very, uh, Kate Purdy, showrunner. Yeah. She's very much into indigenous cultures. Okay. And that's also cool. the, the Indian that's in episode five. Yeah, he was a friend from her from Mexico. He got flown over to the set oh, to to wow. be that Indian, cool. and he also made something. I cannot talk about it for season two. <laughs> uh, something very very beautiful. Okay, and, cool. um, yeah. So she's really into. She's very spiritual, mm -hmm. and uh, and both Raphael and I are. I think Raphael is way more uh, rational, mm -hmm. and I'm somewhere in between. I'm also rational, but I'm. I, I found that the interesting thing, which is also underlying in, in Undone, is of course that spiritualism, almost yeah. new age kind of way of thinking, and a rational uh, worldview. And they sort of collide, and that collision mm -hmm. makes it interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I was worried during season one that it would become too new age like. Because I, when I started, we only had three episodes, and I was very afraid that this Jacob, the, the that father would really become sort of a shaman or something, and, and <laughs> luck, yeah. luckily it was like some actually, he kept pretty genre. rational. Actually, you would you would you would see it. Yeah. Sorry, what? I think he kept pretty rational actually in, in the rational, whole and and he's also kind of an asshole. He turns out to be an asshole. <laughs> he's, not, he's, not a, uh, he's not a spiritual leader at all. He's just not there for some reasons, and he's egoistic and everything. And he commits suicide and kills yeah. somebody. So, oh, this is a spoiler shit for people. Who are <laughs> Sorry, you well. erase this from your brain. You erase it now from your brain. <laughs> Uh, very good. Hisco, we have been talking also a bit about, uh, you have been talking a bit about your inspirations. Um, for us as a, as a, as a movie ch channel, what would be three animated movies that everybody should watch, in your opinion, excluding your own work, of course, then? Yeah. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, did you see my film, Junk Here? No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, it is recommendable, I have to say. It is on yeah, Vimeo for the people watching. Vimeo, so, uh, you can see it yeah. 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 No, but, but you know, I'm, I'm not... I don't watch animation all the time. I watch feature films way more. But the film that I keep watching over and over again is Bambi, which is a, a Disney yeah. film from 1941, I think, 1940. And the reason for that is that, uh, I mean, most people associate it with sentimentality and mm -hmm. all those kinds of things. But you too? Yeah? Yeah, well, well, it, you... was my, it, it was my first uh, cinema experience, and I yeah. had to yeah, cry. Too, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's way, that's, so that's sentimentality, sentimentality in a good way. But... Some people, you know, in the 80s, people would find it uh, the ultimate kitsch. And, but for me, it's not true. I think it's a piece of art. I think that uh, at that time, it was a new medium. So that it was the second, I think, second or third uh, feature animated film. And uh, what I think is that Walt Disney was actually um, trying to make a piece of art. I mean, mm. the composer made an orchestral score that's not that's very close to to real good classical music you know it's very well composed then all the paintings were done most by uh, on oil, with oil paint too or with pastels and okay. all the animation is on such i mean every frame is, is great and then of course what i like about story is that it's not really a story it's more like uh, the nature coming to life you know yeah. and I think the scene of uh, Bambi's mother dying is probably one of the most touching scenes ever made. I think yeah. it's a genius yeah. scene, really. It's, yeah. it's so incredibly touching, you know, and um, for everybody, you know, almost not, not everybody, but I think most people who see it at some stage in their, in their life will be touched, especially if you've lost somebody. Yeah. Uh, so that's... Uh, yeah, the artistic level of that film. And uh, I just keep watching it because I always think like this was, and that's often in, in, in mediums, like also in comics, you know, like Winston McKay who made Little Nemo. That was, he started, he was the first and he already <coughs> raised the bar to an enormous level. And oil painting, it's the same. You know, like, like one of the first oil painters was in, 
in the 16th century was Van Eyck, Jan Van Eyck. Yeah. Well, nobody ever made something as good as Van Eyck anymore. It's so strange that like the inventors of a new medium get to this enormous level and then nobody gets well, to surpass it anymore after how that. is it no, I don't yeah. understand. It's, it's true it's, it, I, I don't know what what happens then after that but i think yeah. it's just that people get so inspired by that possibility yeah. suddenly yeah. Or push themselves to the ultimate limit so to say maybe yeah. i think so yeah yeah i don't yeah. know if it, maybe it's not true but that's how i see it and yeah, yeah. And, and with anime what happened with animation that of course it's a mass medium film and yeah. animation. And yeah. so it got industrial. And, and so now if I'm in a, in a, in a taxi in Los Angeles and people ask me what I do and I tell them I, I'm a director of animated films, they will say, ah, you work in the entertainment industry. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's how not how you like to see yourself, no. It's like, an, it's really in uh, Los Angeles, Hollywood, it's an industry. And yeah. sometimes yeah. beautiful things come out of it. Most of it is complete shit, but the Spirit of the Way would be another one. Did you see that one? Uh, I, saw it I saw it this weekend. I saw this weekend because I, yeah, I heard you talking about, uh, uh, about in, in an interview. I thought I have to see that. It's Japanese, yeah, yeah for yeah. Studio, yeah. studio Ghibli. 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 Uh, Ghibli. Yeah, it's from uh, yeah. Miyazaki. And that's, that's yeah. another film where I think that... Uh, that's a typical uh, example of something that can only be done with animation, like this dreamlike world yeah. where where logic sort of doesn't exist anymore. I mean, there's yeah. an internal logic to, to what happens, but it's really, uh, I think that's that's not a favorite of mine, but it's not very yeah. modern. I think most that comes out of uh, Hollywood right now is really, uh, it's well-crafted entertainment, but it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't have a lot of very, aesthetically pleasing uh, stuff in it for me not yeah. very artistic well no. not not in a way i would like to see it and there's no. another film i think if you are referring to that old interview of mine i still think that father and daughter which is a short film by okay. michael de gogh de wit mm -hmm. it's, it's a dutch guy who lives in uh united, uh, united kingdom uh he made a film that won an oscar called father and daughter and that's a film that you can see, I've seen it 20 or 30 times because wow. it's, it's so touching. But I have to say, does any one of you have children or, or not yet? Mm -hmm. Me. You have children, yeah? yeah? Did you see Father and Daughter? Oh, you should. Oh, it's on YouTube. Yeah. You can find it. You should. If you have a daughter, then it's, it will hit you very, very Okay. Intense. Okay. <laughs> and you will, uh, I can promise you that, that <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's just, it's, it's such a beautiful story. And I, I recommend it because it's, um, a story that you can watch over and over again because it's not really a linear story it's more like a okay poem. so every time you watch it you see different things something new it's, yeah it's not a linear story it's more like a how did you say it? it's more like a, a poem, a po a poem. Mm. like, oh, like, yeah. like a, there is some there's a development and it goes it goes from a to b but it's not a real story it's more like yeah, well, you should watch it. Uh, yeah, there's so much to get out of it. Yeah. Different. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. But before, before I had a, a child, I just thought it was well crafted and it didn't mean anything to me. And it's just uh, a child, it hit I you can, after. Yeah, yeah, because it's about. Yeah, well, I don't want to spoil anything, but it's about. <laughs> no, <laughs> we're about gonna, we're gonna see it. We're gonna see it. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think we can get the picture. Yeah. 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 Is there is there any animated series or movies we should keep a close eye on in the upcoming uh, months? I have no idea. Besides Undone. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not in the coming months, I can tell you that. And when is but it coming? It, um, I think it's projected to be uh, released in, at the end of 2021 or the okay. first okay. months of 2022. And where uh, Amazon gives us deadlines, and they're very, very strict. You can never okay. uh, no. push a deadline. That's just, we don't never get any uh, space there. So that's probably what it's going to be. But why is yeah. it then uh, not not sure yet? It has to do with uh, promotion or uh, Corona, yeah. Corona, or no? It's not sure because um, usually when it's when we're finished, when it's locked, so to say, they need another three months for promotion. Yeah, and okay. so so it just depends on like last time they needed less time; they only needed one and a half month or two months to uh, do that promotion. But so that's why I'm not sure if it will be the end of two thousand. Okay. Beginning yeah. Of yeah. yeah, and and right. will it? Uh, you can, uh, of course, you can't give uh, anything away about the story, but can you at least tell us if it uh, will continue the story of season one or will it be a completely new story? No, so <laughs> that's very hard to answer. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's not, well, no, 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 it's 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 uh, it's continuing, so it's not like okay. yeah. if it, like I can give yes, I can give <laughs> that away that it's not going to be like with. A whole different story, no, of course not. No, no, no. It's it's continuing, continuing, but in a very, 
surprising ways. And, and really okay, okay. Well, we're we're looking forward. And what's what's next uh, in the stars for you? Is there already some other projects that uh, you are working on or preparing? Well, there's there's one project that they asked me for, which I cannot talk about either, and which is not <laughs> certain. Also, but it's with all those huge projects, yeah, yeah, yeah. Certain, because you know, that's, that's just how it works. And then um, I'm, I might have time to do that. It's an exciting project. And then there's an old uh, short film that is completely. It's just four minutes, and I completely bordered it. But it's very ambitious. It's very expensive. If I would have to do it. And that's still on the shelf. It's, yeah. If I would have money and time, I could start now because it's I, the whole concept. But it's I prepared it into the details, and I had to mm. quit because I started on Undone. Yeah, but that's ready to make, and that's sort of a, a, pro, a project from the heart. You know, like something yeah. I really want to make that that will probably, you know, be something that is. Mm, yeah, it's something that that's the problem with short films is that they don't, they're not being broadcasted on Netflix or Amazon. Mm -hmm. So the audience could, well, of course, there's a friend of mine in New York, he made some films that he put on YouTube that have 100 million views. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, you know, it's just yeah. you can be lucky and, and have a YouTube hit, but it just, yeah. the official channels don't broadcast it. So in that way, making short films is kind of a, it's not interesting in a commercial way and it's not mm -hmm. interesting in, uh, in like uh, reaching a broad audience but it is interesting to be uh, kind of free and that's one of the things that i think polanski made some huge films and they didn't do as well and i think he only wants to make i mean i don't think he's he does good films anymore he did his good films in the, in the early 70s but what he said is like the smaller the budget the more i'm in control you know, and if you have a mm -hmm. huge budget, then all people, all kinds of people start to uh, interfere with it. So for me, that's the other interesting thing about making a four minute ambitious film that's yeah. it's completely unrealistic to make uh, because it, it will yeah. cost more than a half a million euros for four Okay. Uh, who's <laughs> going to pay for that? But <laughs> that's one where I have total control, you know, if I have yeah. to. Yeah. Would, would, would it be for you, would you be interested, because you talk about Polanski and also some other directors, would you be interested in in live action directing in the future? Yeah, well, sometimes when I was on the set, in, uh, I used to dream about that because I always thought that animation is kind of limited in what you can do. Um, and because I'm more of a feature film lover. Uh, and when I was on the set, uh, in uh, Los Angeles, I was often thinking like, well, this is going really easy. Why wouldn't I be able to do a feature film? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of stress involved in it. So there's, uh, it's just, I don't know if I really enjoy it. You know, I think, mm. um, I think painting, for instance, is something that's very enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Being on a set, I mean, there's some directors who really like it, but there's also directors like, Brian De Palma, who said he hated it. You know, it's mm. like I, I somebody. I think Kubrick or somebody else compared it with making uh, a painting while you're in a roller coaster. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, and it's just uh, very hard. And um, so I don't know. I, I think you know. Sometimes it's good to be ambitious, and sometimes it's, it's good to be wise. Yeah, I don't know. And also, I will not be asked for it because. People who ask me always ask me for something that's close to what I've done. After yeah. Montage of Heck, which was where the animation was needed for to fill in the visual holes because he, there were audio fragments of eight minutes or seven minutes and there was no visuals. So then Brad Morgan asked me to do the animation and, and the film became so successful that then at least 50 other directors and producers asked me to do exactly the same thing. So I said, yeah, 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 yeah. Because I didn't want to fill their holes, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. my, my purpose in life to, <laughs> to do that. Right. Yeah. Right. So uh, that's not, not in the plan so far. No, no. Well, I, I just think that, you know, I would never like initiate a, pro, a, a live action production in the Netherlands because then you're so limited in uh, yeah. money wise and also yeah, I don't yeah, like of course the acting very much in the Netherlands and I don't like the scripts very much so it's sort of like a, for me not, I, this might sound arrogant if there are filmmakers who watch it I don't mean it that way it's just 
I, I think that it's very hard to make a film in the Netherlands. And yeah. and but, uh, yeah. But, it, but when it comes to animation, it's different, right? In the Netherlands. Yes, that's that's correct. Yeah. So there's absolutely there can be things developed and, and made here. But of course, yeah. for me, it's it's way more interesting if Warner Bros. asked me to do something. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Which, which they did, by the way. So okay. Then, then it becomes like, oh wow, this is not because then you're uh, you can. I'm just getting a message from Kate, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sure. Everything postponed. Got, got some scoop for us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <We're welcome. laughs> yeah our shit's cancelled. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how, how long after you finished the first season? Uh, uh, like, did you really feel like all doors were open suddenly for you? No, no. It's funny that uh, after montage of Hack, I had way more uh, people uh, approach really? me than after. Uh, okay. okay. I don't yeah. know why. I think because Undone is such a unique thing. So mm -hmm. it's not, it's like, I mean, a lot of people approach me like 10 or something or 15 with with all like, oh, we really want to make something in this style, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that, that's how it goes. And, but it's, you know, I'm not really interested. No, I don't know. I, I just, I knew that season two was going to happen. So I didn't have time yeah. for it either. Yeah. Is, there, is there already uh, a season three in the plans or is it already clear that this is it? No, it should. It can continue. Yeah, it can, no, it can it should, continue. It should continue. Actually, I think. I think that. Uh, so I'm not allowed to say these kind of things, but I <laughs> think. I think that, like in, uh, with season one, that sort of ended in a way that is uh, when I read use. I think critics, uh, they all like it, but a lot of user user comments are like, "Oh, I would give this this series a ten, but because of this." Frustrating ending. I give it a one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and because people don't like open endings, no. yeah. you know, yes, you, know, you know this. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Open ended. The book has got open ended. Open ended. Yeah. The book has. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so people don't like open ambiguous endings. But the yeah. great thing about season one is that I think as a whole it could just be ended there. For for me it was yeah. like that ending was perfect for me personally. Yeah. I. I, I I think yeah. it's great, but a lot of people don't like that kind of endings. Yeah. Well, they're in for a ride. I can tell you that. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> well, that's a, good, that's a good thing. Well, I'm going to try less one time at the end of this, this interview. Is there one thing you can tell us about the season two or maybe describe it in some words? Give us something. Nothing at all, no? <laughs> no, I mean, that's... No, I'm sorry. It's just really... Um, I mean, if I would say something, then uh, maybe I, I, I'm very poor tomorrow. So you I'm get sued. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I really want to that we, stuff, yeah. we don't want to do that to you. No. Oh. Well, the grandmother, maybe the grandmother was being mentioned uh, in season one. Uh, yeah. Are we going to see her? <laughs> Your dreams. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we take it to yeah. the south far we get well uh, Hisco <coughs> thank you very much for your time yes. it was great uh, great thank talking you to you uh, for the people watching uh, that didn't see Undone yet watch it on Amazon Prime and next year watch season 2 and if you want to stay updated on Undone uh, don't forget to subscribe on our channel because we will keep a close uh, eye on it yeah, then, and maybe uh, uh, we can talk with Hisco when he's allowed to talk uh, about season yeah, two. Sure, uh, sure. Probably in a year, uh, if it's being released at the end of the yeah. twenty twenty one. Yeah, I think yeah. it's more than a year, but uh, that's fine. You can uh, we can have a. Uh, you know, at that time, it's, it will be different. We will have to uh, ask for uh, official permission from Amazon. Okay. But that, okay. Will be fine. that will be all fine. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Nice. Look forward to it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much.